So when do we begin? Uh, theoretically, in one minute. You and, said uh, one minute. So one minute. I will share your time. Okay. Hi. Hello. Okay, so it's a time. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, Edo McDonald from uh, University of New, New South Wales, Australia. Uh, he will talk on a semi classical y law and exact spectral asymptotics in non commutative geometry. So please. Uh, great. Thank you, Tsuyoshi. And especially thank you for inviting me to give a talk at this seminar. It's um, very exciting. It's fun to talk to people on the other side of the world. And I'm going to talk about something that I think is very interesting, and at least for me, is very new. This sort of material about semi-classical vial laws and exact spectral asymptotics, I think that for some people, it might be a little bit old news. You may have seen this before in various forms. But for me, it's new, and I think it's very interesting. So hopefully, I'll be able to share at least my own point of view on the topic. So this is about some work I've been doing with my former PhD advisors, Fedor Sukachev and Dmitry Zanin. Um, but I also advise you to look at um, some other recent work that I've done with Raphael Ponge, um, which is now on archive. These are the archive numbers. Um, the work's not, well, it is directly related since I use some of those results that we got there here, but this sort of goes in a different direction. So here is what I'm intending to talk about today. And I will go over these things for people who haven't seen them before. So we're going to talk about the semi-classical vial law, or at least one form of the semi-classical vial law. I'll remind you about various things relating to Kahn's integral formula, ideals, traces, measurability, and the like. And um, finally, I'm going to give you some interesting results, including what I think is a very interesting Talberian theorem. Um, so let's get started and I'll give some of the physical background. The, this is very physics-like. I'm not really a physics person. Um, so you'll have to be patient with me if you know this stuff better than I do as I go through this very slowly. But suppose you have U is here an open bounded subset of Euclidean space. And V, let's say it's a smooth potential. Oh, and it's real valued. And when I say it's smooth and bounded, let's say all the derivatives are bounded as well. We're considering the Schrodinger operator. Here, h bar is just a positive parameter. Delta is the, the Laplace operator, which is the Laplace operator on u with directly boundary conditions. And by mv, I just mean v. So the, the operator of pointwise multiplication by v. So the general abstract theory implies that since v is a relatively compact, actually just a bounded perturbation of this operator delta, which has no essential spectrum, we get the same thing for HV. So I didn't say that V is real valued, but V is real valued. And HV is a self-adjoint operator. It's lower bounded and the spectrum is discrete, meaning that all you get is a sequence of eigenvalues, um, each of which has finite multiplicity. The lowest one is perhaps less than zero, but it's certainly bigger than minus infinity. And they're arranged in increasing order, or at least non-decreasing order like this. And they go up to positive infinity as n goes to infinity. Okay, so the spectral counting function, this is nthv. This is the number of eigenvectors, well, or rather in quantum mechanical language, it's the number of states with energy less than or less than t, or rather, it's the dimension of the span of the eigenvectors of HV whose corresponding eigenvalue is less than t. Or to put it a little bit differently, it's the number of n bigger than or equal to zero, such that the nth eigenvalue um, of HV, where these are in numerated so that they're in non-decreasing order, such that lambda nhv is strictly less than t. And there's one particular value of this, which is n0hv, 
This is what's called the number of bound states of HV. I'm not a physicist. My understanding is that this is a concept that's quite important. And that what people would like to know is how large is an HV, at least roughly speaking. So the following is a guess. It's called semi-classical because it kind of combines quantum mechanical and classical estimates. So what you do is you look at the corresponding classical mechanical Hamiltonian, um, which is going to be the function on x and p of norm of p squared plus vx, where x and p, they live in the classical phase space, u times rd. What we're going to do for our guess for the number of eigenvalues or the dimension of the span of the eigenvalues of HV with corresponding eigenvalue negative, we're going to guess that it's roughly the same as the volume in phase space of those X and P such that the Hamiltonian, classical Hamiltonian, is less than zero, uh, divided by H, part, H bar times 2 pi to the power D. If you like, it's the number of H's to the power D that you can fit inside this volume of phase space. Um, so I guess here's a picture that I made. Here you've got a fairly simple potential. This is one dimensional. Here's x and here's p. These are the level sets. The area where this hxp, which is a quartic potential, the area where it's negative in phase space, it's this inner dark blue region here. And so I guess the semi-classical estimate says that we should guess that this area, this dark blue area, is roughly equal to the number of bound states, states of the quantum Hamiltonian H, V. Um, but, well, they can't be exactly equal. They, they certainly can't be exactly equal because one of them is integral valued and the other one's real valued in general. Um, but they aren't even necessarily close to one another. So here I'm quoting one of Barry Simon's books. Um, in his notation, NV is what I call NHV. Um, so it's clear that in general, NV can be zero, even though the semi-classical estimate is very large. And he gives this example. Imagine that you have a million shallow square potential wells. This will not bound any states, but the semi-classical estimate or the area in classical phase space where it's the potential is, sorry, where the Hamiltonian is negative um, will nevertheless be very large. Um, what you can hope is that semi-classically, they ought to be the same. And this is the content of the semi-classical vial law. Now, I don't know exactly who first proved this. I believe it was Martin in 1972. But as I'll explain a little bit later, there's a couple of different ways of writing this theorem. And it's not entirely clear to me exactly who was the first to write down something that is approximately equivalent to this theorem. So what it says is that in the semi-classical limit, that is, as this parameter h bar goes to zero, the number of bound states to the Hamiltonian is asymptotically equivalent to its semi-classical estimate. Or writing it a bit differently, for every t in R, the number of eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian with potential v less than t um, times h bar power d it's going to converge to this corresponding volume of the classical phase space. This is a very nice theorem. It's very pleasing. Um, so just for future reference, let me point out that this quantity I've written on the right-hand side here, just by Frobini's theorem, you can compute what it actually is. It's an integral of a certain function over the uh, volume u, um, t minus v plus. I write plus for the positive part of the function. So th this is just what it is when you compute it out. Um, so this is a very famous theorem. It's a very important theorem. People have worked on this for a long time. Um, there's a version of it for closed Riemannian manifolds. This is one that I got from Victor Ivory's book or one of his books. I'm not sure exactly who first proved this. This is a very active, very intensely studied area of research. But as far as I know, basically the state of the art um, in this area involves developing remainder terms. So this, this is a version of the semi-classical vial law. Suppose you have a closed Riemannian manifold, Laplace Beltrami operator, delta G associated to the metric G, and you've got a volume form mu G. Then for all real valued, I should say real valued C infinity potentials, we have 
this asymptotic formula with this remainder term. Now, if you know anything about this area, the idea of vial laws in general, you'll know that these remainder terms are vastly more difficult to get than just the leading term and the asymptotic. So this is a very advanced theorem and it's proved using very sophisticated geometrical techniques. Um, but that's the state of the art and we won't need to discuss anything quite so sophisticated here today. Okay, so let me talk about something different, which is con integration formula, which I call here a closely related topic. And they are closely related. And for certain people who are experts in this area, I know for Grigory Rosenblum in, these, in the audience, I think he probably considers this very, very clear that these are almost the same statement. Um, but con integration formula comes from a completely different area. It says the following. Suppose again, one once again has a d-dimensional closed Riemannian manifold and a smooth function on that manifold. Phi is a positive normalized trace on L1 infinity. I will remind you in a moment what this means if you have forgot or if you never knew this. Phi evaluated on this operator here reproduces the integral of the function f with some constant. Um, in particular, when this holds when phi is a Dixmere trace. Phi is a positive normalized trace here. Now I've written this in a way that is a little bit different from how you might've seen it before. I've written it in symmetrized form. So here we've got one minus delta minus d on four times mf, one minus delta minus d on four, rather than having all the mfs on the left and one minus deltas on the right. This version's a little bit more convenient for what I wanna discuss in a moment. Uh, so let me remind you about all these operator theoretic stuff. Um, suppose h is a Hilbert space and you have t, it's a compact operator on h. This h is supposed to be the same as this h, by the way. So the singular value sequence mu kt of a compact operator is defined as follows. Mu kt, it's the distance of t from the set of operators whose rank is at most k, or it's the inf of the norm of t minus r, where the rank of r is less than or equal to k. Um, or in terms of spectral theory, mu kt, it's the sequence of eigenvalues of the absolute value, absolute value of t arranged in non-increasing order with multiplicities. So the weak trace class, L1 infinity, these are those compact operators such that mu k of t is big O of one on k. Or if you like, the soup of one plus k mu kt is finite. This is an ideal of the algebra of all bounded linear operators. And similarly, there's Lp infinity when the eigenvalues go like k to the one on p, sorry, when the singular values go like k to the one on p, or rather if the absolute value of t to the power p is in L1 infinity. In the language of Kahn's quantized calculus, these compact operators are called infinitesimals and L1 infinity are the infinitesimals of order one and LP infinity are the infinitesimals of order p. So what is a trace? So a trace is a functional on L1 infinity um, if it is unitarily invariant, that is phi of u star t u is the same as phi of t for all t means that phi is a trace. So just because every bounded linear operator is a sum of at most, I think it's eight or four unitary operators. Um, for all bounded linear operators S and all t and L1 infinity, this unitary invariance implies that phi vanishes on commutators or phi st is phi ts. Um, so some terminology regarding traces. First of all, there are traces on L1 infinity, of which the most famous ones, the Dixmere traces, but there are many others. All of them are singular. Singular means they vanish on finite rank operators. As a matter of fact, they all vanish on L1. They vanish on the trace class ideal. Um, but there are non-zero traces, and we'll call them normalized if they have value one on this um, harmonic sequence, phi of one over one plus n is equal to one. And a trace is said to be positive if it is positive as a linear functional. That is, if t is a positive element of L1 infinity, then phi of t is bigger than or equal to zero. So thinking about con integral formula, I've now defined all of this terminology. Phi is a positive normalized trace on L1 infinity. Okay. So 
what does con integral formula actually imply about the spectrum of the operator inside the trace? Now, here's where we take f to be a positive function so that this operator, which was inside the trace, is a positive element. What does it mean for the spectrum of this operator that con integral formula holds, which implies trivially that all of the positive normalized traces on L1 infinity take the same value on this operator. That is to say, this operator, one minus delta minus D on four times MF times one minus delta minus D on four is PT measurable, PT for positive trace. It means that all positive traces on L1 infinity, positive normalized traces, of course, coincide on this operator. So as a matter of fact, we know exactly which operators have this property. So it turns out that a positive operator is PT measurable if and only if you have this certain asymptotic condition on the singular values. So phi t is equal to c for all positive normalized traces phi if and only if you have that this certain limit of averages of the singular values it exists and it converges uniformly in a parameter m. It's a certain condition. The point I'm trying to make is that con integral formula implies a certain asymptotic property on the spectrum of the operator inside the trace. But this particular operator, we know a lot more about it. It is a pseudo differential operator of negative order. And a lot is known about these operators. Um, so in particular, we have this formula. So this is something to be distinguished from con integral formula for a number of reasons. What I'm saying is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the singular values of this operator, I'm saying f here is positive, so this is a positive operator, the limit exists and equals the integral of f. So this is something that it was known before, con integral formula, um, but it's, I think, quite different in character. I'm, again, not completely sure who the first person who proved this and what degree of generality is. This was known to Biermann and Solomyak, at least in the late 1970s. It may have been known to them earlier. I'm not completely sure on the history here. Um, but this is kind of different from con integral formula. One reason why it's different is that what's on the right-hand side is obviously a linear, or at least an additive function of f. What's on the left, there's no a priori reason at all why it should be linear. Um, also, it's proved in a totally different way. If you think about how you prove con integral formula, more or less what you say is that, let me go back to the statement, this quantity on the right-hand side, it's a linear functional, just by the basic continuity properties of the trace, it is a continuous linear functional on the space of all continuous functions on the Riemannian manifold X. Therefore, it represents a measure. And then you give some sort of argument involving invariance under isometries, means you can deduce that it is exactly the integral of F. And then you just have to figure out the constant and you can get that just by Weyl's asymptotic formula. That's easy. Uh, so the proof, at least the proofs that I know of this statement are quite different. Behrman and Solomyak gave a um, proof which is in totally different character. But regardless, I just wanted to point out that this formula, it does imply con integral formula for positive normalized traces. And also this formula, it's been improved in various forms. So I believe it's known not only that this formula holds, but it also holds for quite general negative order pseudo differential operators, where this quantity on the right is changed to something appropriate. And also the remainder term is known. Uh, this sort of thing is outlined in Ivory's books. Um, but con integral formula is different. And one of the reasons it's different is it motivates the definition of the integration functional in non-commutative geometry. So what am I talking about here? So I suspect that for this audience, I don't need to remind you what is a spectral triple. So I've skipped the definition. But AHD is a unital spectral triple Hilbert space H, algebra A, Dirac type operator D. Um, and there's a representation, a unital representation of the algebra A on H, which I'll call rho. Um, I'm gonna be dealing with the so-called LP infinity summable spectral triples. Um, spectral triple is LP infinity summable for P bigger than zero. If um, the resolvent of D to the power P 
is in L1 infinity. Or if you like, if the resolvents of D are in LP infinity of H. Now, according to the standard notation, um, which is often used in this area, we write integral with a bar through it to mean a positive normalized trace, or depending as appropriate, maybe a continuous trace on L1 infinity. And DS is the so-called quantized line element. Um, it denotes this thing. It's the absolute value of, if you like, a resolvent of D. Um, the integration functional on a spectral triple, it's defined as follows. You write integral A DS power P, which means literally you take a normalized trace. Well, often it's positive trace phi on L1 infinity, and you evaluate it on this row of A times one plus D squared minus P on two. In the case when D squared is your Laplace Beltrami operator and A is an algebra of smooth functions, then this does coincide with at least up to a constant with the integral with respect to the Riemannian volume measure by con integral formula. Um, and this is a good definition of the integral. Um, here's something which would not be a very good definition of the integral. Now you might think motivated by the commutative case that you don't need the singular traces at all. You could just take the limit as n goes to infinity of mu n one plus d squared minus p on four times rho a one plus d squared minus p on four. The trouble is that in this abstract operator theoretic setting, there's no guarantee at all that the limit even exists. Um, whereas, of course, that's not really something you have to think about in the usual definition of the integration functional. And even if it did exist, I don't think it's obvious at all, if it's even true, that this would actually extend to a linear functional on the algebra A, or even an additive functional on the cone of positive elements of A. I, I think there's no obvious reason why that would be the case. Um, so it might come as a surprise that for a lot of spectral triples, I'll give you examples later, this limit actually does exist. And so you could actually have the integration formula for quite general spectral triples without singular traces. What do I mean by quite general spectral triples? I should probably give you some, I should probably justify that with some details. Okay, so we're gonna consider LP infinity summable spectral triples, which obey the following conditions. Uh, first of all, the QC1. This is just a technical condition. It means that if you take the commutator of rho of A, um, there shouldn't be an extra bar here, commutator of rho of A with the absolute value of D, then it's bounded for every A in the algebra A. Second assumption, again, a technical assumption, closure under the holomorphic functional calculus, which means exactly what you think it means. It means that if you have an element A of the algebra and there is a function which is holomorphic on a neighborhood of the spectrum of rho of A, then F of rho of A coincides with rho of some element in the algebra. And then there's a third condition, which is something different. I, I guess it's not so unfamiliar um, in this area since assumption, so-called zeta function or spectral dimension assumptions are often made in this area. But, gonna, but I'm gonna make this following assumption. For every positive element of the algebra, there exists a real number such that this function of a complex variable z, z goes to the trace of rho a power z times, if you like, resolvent of d power minus z minus c over z minus p extends continuously to the closed half plane. So since rho of a is bounded and one plus d squared minus l on two, this is an L1 infinity or it's an LP infinity um, when z is one. This is certainly defined and it's a holomorphic function when the real part of Z is bigger than P. What I'm asserting is that it should extend continuously to the closed half plane, real part Z bigger than or equal to P. Um, so in geometric examples, um, for instance, if D squared was an elliptic operator on a manifold and A was just pointwise multiplication by a positive smooth function, this is more or less straightforward to prove. It turns out that in that case, this function rho a z times et cetera is, um, you can prove that it's, it actually has meromorphic continuation to the whole half plane um, with possibly a simple pole 
at z equals p, which would be the dimension in that case. So in the um, commutative case, verifying this condition is more or less straightforward. And in fact, we get something which is much stronger. You can also verify it more or less straightforward forwardly for non-commutative tori. Uh, okay. Me, what yes. what is the reason why you put a, a rho of a to the power z in the ah, formula? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I would I would ideally not have the z here, um, because yes. if there wasn't a z, then this would be I guess this would be implied by one of these um, discrete spectral dimension or simple right. dimension spectrum conditions, which is very often right. used. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd like to have that. Uh, but for the proof I have in mind, I really do need the Z yeah. here. And it's not obvious to me how it relates to the more conventional assumptions. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so suppose you have those conditions. And suppose the dimension P, suppose it's bigger than two. Then for every positive element of the algebra, the limit exists. This limit exists. You don't need to take a singular trace. Uh, but if you do take a singular trace and you use the same notation as before, then you get this following very pleasing formula. I like this. Let's just take a moment to appreciate this. So once again, the integral with the bar, it means the common value of all positive normalized traces on L1 infinity. What this says is that the common value can be computed by a limit, not an extended limit, not a Banach limit, but a limit. And you have this very nice formula. Here, again, A is positive. And um, honestly, I think it's remarkable. Again, I don't think it's obvious that what's written on the left here should be should have linear extension. Like, there's no obvious that this would be additive on the cone of positive elements in the algebra A. But obviously, what's on the right, it is an additive functional of A. Um, so, so clearly what's on the left must also be additive, but I don't think it's obvious. Um, somehow this additivity, it's encoded in this zeta function condition in a subtle way that I don't really understand. So that's very nice. Um, so let me give you some brief indication for how we prove this, because the proof is totally different from what you'll see in the classical case that Biermann and Solomyak knew about. Um, it's entirely abstract, just using abstract operator theory. And it's using what I call a non-commutative Talberian theorem, which is a bit like wiener ikahara theorem. Not quite as good, but it's more general in another way. Um, so this is phrased in completely abstract language. Suppose you have two positive bounded operators, A and B. Uh, they don't have to commute with each other, but they do satisfy the following conditions. B is an LP infinity or B is a, it's an infinitesimal of order P in Kahn's language, and P is bigger than two. Um, the commutator of the square root of A with B, it's in a slightly smaller ideal. It's LP on two infinity. If there exists C and R such that the function trace AZ, PZ minus C over Z minus P admits a continuous extension to the closed half plane, then there exists this limit, mu n mu n b p on two a p b p on two is equal to c on p. Um, so there's some things to remark about. So the first thing is that we make the assumption that p is bigger than two. I don't think that's really essential. That's just something we made to be convenient for the proof. Um, probably that could be removed with a certain amount of effort. The trouble is that when p is less than or equal to 2, this space LP on 2 infinity, it's a quasi Banach space. And you have to think a little bit harder about that. But regardless, I'm confident that this, or maybe a slight modification of this, will be true when p is less than or equal to 2. Um, the other thing is, suppose that A and B commute, right? This is almost the wiener ikahara theorem. The difference is that the wiener ikahara theorem, you wouldn't need to make this extra assumption that you have these um, estimates in the singular values, that it's an LP infinity. In the wiener ikahara theorem, that comes for free. Here, we have to make that extra assumption. And of course, wiener ikahara, you don't need p bigger than 2. Um, so that's why I like to call it a non-commutative wiener ikahara. But really, when they do commute, it's not as strong as the wiener ikahara theorem. So it's not totally satisfactory. Um, but regardless, 
Um, basically, if you want to prove the existence of this limit, it's not hard. All you need to do is apply the previous Tauberian theorem to these operators. B is like absolute value of the resolvent of D, and A is one on P times rho of A. And these conditions of the theorem basically come from the um, assumptions that I made on the spectral triple. Um, so I said that the spectral triple, you had to have closure under the holomorphic functional calculus. You don't need that. You don't need anything nearly as strong as that. I only make that assumption because I want to say that a to the power one on P when A is strictly bigger than zero is an element of the algebra. That's all you need really. Um, so there's well, a lot of- always, yep. You could always close it under holomorphic calculus because uh, I mean, the, the conditions are, are, are closable under holomorphic calculus. Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact that, you know, the commutator is bounded and the commutator with absolute of D is bounded. Yep. These conditions are stable under holomorphic calculus. Ah, interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, Okay, so I guess with that piece of information, this um, this assumption is redundant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have made, we make two assumptions. Uh, so where was I? Okay, so let me now talk about the semi-classical vial law, um, which is interesting. It might be old news for some other people, but for me it's new, and I think it provides a different perspective on these sorts of formulas. Um, so. The proof here is going to be based on the Biermann Schwinger principle. There are many different forms of the Biermann Schwinger principle in the literature. The exact one I'm going to refer to um, is something that is found in a paper of myself with Raphael Ponge, but there's certainly predecessors of it in various forms throughout the literature. I'm not going to state the most general form of it. I'm going to state a consequence of the Biermann Schwinger principle, if you like, kind of semi classical Biermann Schwinger principle. Um, more or less what it says, at least for the purposes of this talk, what it says is the following. Suppose you have T, it's a positive unbounded linear operator on a, self, on a Hilbert space H, um, and the resolvent is compact. V, it's a self-adjoint bounded linear operator. Um, for all Q bigger than zero, the following two limits coincide if either limit exists. I say if the limit on the right exists just because the proof is a little bit simpler, but they actually coincide if either limit exists. Uh, now I know this is not, if you know the Beerman Schwinger principle, you might be shouting at me, no, this is not literally what it normally is. This is a consequence of the principle, but for the purpose of this talk, this is all I mean. Um, so also because it's very, very important in the spectral theory of Schrodinger operators, there are many different extensions of this formula. T doesn't have to have compact resolvent. V doesn't have to be bounded. The sum can be taken in the sense of differential forms. There's many, many different weakenings of the assumptions and strengthenings of the statement that are known. But regardless, this is gonna suffice for the purposes of this talk. Um, but regardless, granted that, if you know that we have the existence of this limit, via the Biermann Schwinger principle and, and certain technical arguments, which I will omit, you can get a semi-classical via law for spectral triples, which I find very, very nice. Um, so here, AHD is a spectral triple. It obeys the same conditions that I outlined above. Uh, the dimension's now bigger than four rather than bigger than two. That's for certain technical issues in the um, throughout the argument. I wouldn't say it's all that important. Uh, probably it can be removed. I would like to remove it. That's why this is not totally satisfactory. Suppose you have a self-adjoint element of the algebra A. Um, then for all real numbers T, the following limits, they exist and they coincide. The limit as H goes to zero, H power dimension. And then you take the number of, or the number of, how do we say it? Number of states, or rather the dimension of the, span of the eigenspaces of this operator with corresponding eigenvalue less than t, where the operator here, it's like a kind of Schrodinger operator. You take h squared times d squared plus rho of v, it turns out to be equal to this limit, um, which if you write it in this quantized calculus notation gives again this very pleasing expression. And I like this very much. Um, I think that these conditions on the spectral triple, although the not something that you can really find in the literature. They are kind of natural and very general. Um, and you get this very nice 
formula, semi-classical vial law for spectral triples. Um, so if you'll forgive me getting a little bit philosophical for the moment, um, I, I think that this, it gives a nice new interpretation of what this quantized integral means, um, this integral bar. You can say that the integral in the NCG sense of A, it's related to the number of states bound by a Schrodinger operator, um, h bar squared d squared minus some power of A. I think it's nice. Now, as I said, I think this is the sort of thing that certain people who work in this area would consider kind of obvious. For me, it's not obvious at all. Um, I, I haven't seen this remark done before, and I think it's very nice. It looks like I'm going to finish radically under time. Um, but let me briefly mention some of the examples. So um, these assumptions on the spectral triple, they're easy enough to verify in examples. So as I said, in the commutative examples, by which I mean the geometric examples where D is a first order elliptic differential operator, H is sections of some vector bundle. Um, this follows from the standard theory of complex powers of elliptic differential operators without great deal of difficulty. You can also verify it for non-commutative tori, it's not hard. You can do it for other theta deformations. I believe we checked it for these um, um, theta deformed spheres, C, S3 theta. You could probably do it for some others. We'd like to do it for um, some of these quantum group examples too, like SUQ2, but I haven't done that yet. Um, so let me briefly indicate how this looks for non-commutative tori, because um, in, uh, my papers with Raphael, we did conjecture that a formula like this will hold for non-commutative tori. But when we wrote this, we thought that to prove it, you'd need to develop the whole theory of semi-classical analysis. But actually, you don't. You just need certain basic non-commutative um, uh, Tauberian sort of results. And so, OK, in the notation for non-commutative tori, basically, the substance of these theorems that are written on the screen say that you have a semi-classical vial law and you have this, what I call exact spectral asymptotic. Tau of A, tau is the canonical trace, it's the integration functional on non-commutative tori. Um, but I wouldn't say that this is really totally satisfactory as a proof. Um, I, I'm not totally satisfied with this. The first problem is this assumption that the dimension is bigger than four. I think that's a little bit untidy, probably with some extra effort that could be removed. Also, I think um, this really only scratches the surface of what could be said. You could put a quite general pseudo differential operator here. Um, and the conditions on the element A, they could certainly be weakened. I know this because of the Sweekle type estimates that we proved with Raphael. Um, OK, so I'm finishing far be before my time limit. I'm just reminded of something that um, Fedor often says, my former advisor, Fedor Sukachev. He says that if you finish a talk five minutes over time, you've made enemies for a lifetime. If you finish five minutes under time, you've made friends for a lifetime. Um, so hopefully that's true. And um, so I, I want to conclude the talk with a question for the audience, um, which is, Thankfully, something Alan already asked about is this sort of zeta function condition on the spectral triple AHD. Um, so here I said that you have to assume some sort of continuous extension of this function to the closed half plane real parts at bigger than or equal to t. What I would like to know and what I don't know is how does this relate to the other assumptions that can be found in the literature? concerning these zeta functions of spectral triples. OK, thank you all for listening and for inviting me. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for very interesting talk. Any question or comment? Uh, yes, well, I, I have one, one general question. Yep. Uh, concerning, yep. you know, the, the your last uh, slide before. Yes. So, so I mean, the, there is a very wide variety of examples which you have to um, play with in order to see exactly the limits of your um, uh, Tauberian theorem and so on, mm -hmm. which are, if you want, the, the case of fractals. 
because oh. there is a spectral triple which is associated to a fractal. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when you do that, I mean, according if you want to the scaling of the fractal and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, what will happen is that, um, for instance, the dimension spectrum will contain imaginary values mm -hmm. and uh, and so on. So I mean, it uh, so by playing with this example, this this very large mm -hmm. class of examples, mm -hmm. you you can probably first of all find a lot of examples where you don't have this um, equivalence. With the limit of n times mu n, if you want, where you really need to take Cesaro means and so on for, mm. to, to have the, the trace uh, which is additive. So, mm. uh, for, for in, we, in this class, you will easily find examples where, if you want, the formula by a limit of n is not additive. And, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, because if you want the, the, the key observation of Dixmier mm. was the fact that you have inequalities. Which become equalities only when you um, you would take Cesar means and so on. Mm. So so I mean it's, it's extremely unlikely that you you would get an additivity without doing this operation. So mm. I, I so this is the first thing I want to say. Now of course and the second thing I want to say is that you know it's more on the philosophical side, which is that these singular traces and the Dixme trace. I mean they are the first example. In my mind, I, I might be wrong, where if you want, you can separate the integral sign from the measure. What I have in mind is the following, is that you know, when you do normal measure theory, you, you write integral of f of x d mu of x. Hmm. And, and the package is given to you as a wall. And the, you, you can only write this because you have the measure here. Hmm. But the, the Dixme trace or the singular trace, they have the, the remarkable, feature that the integral sign is not at all depending on what you put after it. The integral sign is the phi or if you want the Dixme trace and such things. And then you put an infinitesimal which has the right order and okay. And then you know you 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 make sense of the thing. So the two things are completely independent. Mm. And uh, and also in many ways you know it is uh, it is really what I would call the semi classical filter. In the mm. sense that because the singular trace gives a zero value to anything, any infinitesimal of higher order, what it means is that it filter out, filters out all the quantum details. It gives mm. you a kind of, you know, of a classical picture of mm. what is going on. And it is in that way that I really, you know, consider that it is a, a, a very important tool. It's, it's really a a kind of filtering which gives you a classical view, if you want, of, of things. So you don't need to have an h bar go to zero or anything like that. I mean, it's something which once and for all filters mm. things. Of course, it's mm. extremely important to make the relations that you do, you know, between, of course, you know, the expansions and so on. And in particular in the, in the case of Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger operators, I mean, I think this is, uh, that's uh, something which, for instance, I didn't consider at all. So I mean, I think it's uh, very, very interesting to, to, to pursue in that direction. But, but the, for the technical part of the Tauberian stuff, I think you know the, the fractals. They are an ideal uh, uh, um, source of examples. I mean, a spectral yeah. triple. I mean, where you, you can you can experiment a lot in, in that respect. Oh, thank you. I'll definitely look into that um, because I think, yeah, the idea of complex point in the dimension spectrum really, um, it's very interesting. Yes, it's, I, I can tell you one more thing about that, which is that what you get for dimension spectrum is very similar to when you do uh, number theory over yeah. finite fields. Because uh -huh. when you do number theory over finite fields, the data function, yeah. uh, it is a periodic function in terms of to pi over log q, where q is uh, the number of elements of the finite field. Yeah. So, so, so it has exactly these complex points in the same way. Mm. In the case of fractals, the, the q is replaced by the scaling ratio. If you want. So, I mean, mm. it's uh, mm. so it's something mm. which is uh, kind of a, uh, there is somebody who worked very nicely on that in that respect. It's uh, Lapidus. Uh, ah, you know, yes, yes. About that. But but the spectral triples, I think it's Christensen who, who developed spectral triples. I, I had written in my book also. I mean, but uh, Christensen has developed very carefully the, the thing. Mm. 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 
Thank you. Other question? I have a question. Uh, here, the condition in the, in the latest results, the condition of the uh, A is uh, not sorry. negative. Uh, your voice uh, is very, uh, contains noise. C can you repeat once more again? C can you repeat your question? Something about the conditions in the theorem. Um, so let me pick a theorem, maybe this theorem. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. The, that was too much problem with the... So can, can you send us uh, your question by chat? Okay. It's technical problems. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, other question or comment? Can I ask a question about uh, if your A and B are one is just, uh, let's say, D, your D, and another one is another D for another metric, let's say, on a manifold? Can you? Can you tell something about this um, case of formal transformations, KDK, for example, K positive or another? Yeah. D. Okay. Okay. So, in what we have, so B B is the resolvent of D, and so you're saying, um, let's imagine that A is actually, um, well, it's a resolvent of another D. Um, hmm. So let's think. So. If that, so this would be an operator of order. This is an operator of order minus one. This is an operator of order minus a half. So this is going to have order minus a half minus two. So what is that? Minus five on two, which is going to be in LP on two infinity. When, what, when is that going to be? There'll be some condition on the dimension. Um, so it'd be when the dimension's bigger than something or other. Yeah, okay, I have no idea. Sorry, I'm just speculating. Um, at, at least in principle, it could work. I don't know what it would give, but it would give some sort of, um, I, I guess you'd have to verify this condition. That's probably not hard to verify. Yeah, it'd probably give something. I don't know what it would give. Thanks. Other questions? 
Okay, so let me ask one question. So yes. in, uh, in the commutative case, uh, yeah. uh, so it, can you extract some information on smooth structure on the underlying manifold? Uh, a priori, um, you are using the differential operator stuff, yeah. but the uh, result in, is uh, just topological. Um, well, I don't know. So I, I'm not really an expert on spectral triples. What I, what I know about this result is that it sort of, it neglects a good deal of the structure of the spectral triple. So we only use D squared, basically. We don't use D. Um, so we don't use the, the K homological content of the spectral triple. Um, I'm afraid I don't know enough about it to say if you could reconstruct the algebra A. Um, I, I don't know enough about it. Uh, I, I didn't understand the, the question. I mean, you know, I mean, what one knows is that, okay, one can reconstruct everything. If you have the spectral triple, you can reconstruct the manifold, of course. So, And you can reconstruct the metric and everything. I mean. So can you generalize to the cyclic or cyclic case? Oh. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, again, you know, this is, um, yeah. So probably what the question means that when you want to find the Oxshield class of the, of the term character hmm. as, as a Oxshield class, yes. Hmm. As a, okay, which is given by a singular trace. So, um, I mean, of course, uh, this, it is quite important to know convergence in that case. So that's a very good question indeed. So, so you you don't know you didn't think about this this question? Or? No, I didn't think about it. I I'm <laughs> confident that, um, yeah, that that's certainly something that can be approached. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's feasible. You probably need stronger conditions than what what's here, but it may mm -hmm. well be the case that if you 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 take here, so it would have to be some, maybe not. Okay, you take. Here would be the Hochschild class, the Chern character. Right. You'd have yeah, to say it's yeah. positive somehow. Um, yeah, <laughs> I see. Do you yeah. need positivity really? Yeah, because of you raised to the power Z. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a bit, yeah. I mean, um, I'm really wondering why, why you have to raise to the power Z really, because, okay, as, it, as you said in the proof by using straight forward the, the, the Tarberian uh, theorem, I understand why. On the other hand, okay, one can expand rho of a to the power z using the Newton formula. Hmm. Hmm. And, um, and if you do that, uh, it might very well be the case that you can dispense with, um, you see, the, hmm. the Newton formula, it's a generalization when of the binomial formula where you replace the, the n by a, by a complex number. Hmm. Hmm. And that, yeah. that formula is extremely efficient. I mean, uh, and, uh, so, so I, I would I would believe that you could pass from one condition without the z to the condition without with the z without mm. too much effort by using Newton's formula mm. because it will it will give you a kind of Taylor expansion around z equals yeah, one so. yeah you see and and there is a there is a Newton formula with a remainder also where you really control what is going on. Would you need some sort of uniform control over? Yeah, um, I understand that you need some yeah. uniform control, but uh, but that's yeah. precisely the type of stuff that you get from the Newton formula. I mean, uh, right, right. You see, okay. so you, it's a kind of Taylor expansion of yeah. rho of a to the power z yeah. near z equals one. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Where what the what you have are uh, like binomial coefficients, but with integers replaced by z. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you'd have to deal with, so you'd have rho a to the power n and for every n, not yeah. No, 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 not really. No, 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 I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think, uh, mm. well, even if you add rho of a to the n, I mean, you know, this is of course a simple function of a, so I mean, yeah. which is in the algebra. Problem. So. Yeah. So, no, no, what, what you need is to use the, the formula for the remainder. Right, okay. Which okay. is an integral formula and yep. which uh, should, be, should be under control in a way, so. Mm. 
So okay, actually, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something to think about. Uh, Certainly. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, because having positivity, then it would be difficult for the other case, indeed. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. yeah, I mean, so there's one way that you can kind of yeah, so without positivity, I guess the formulation of the theorem would have to be di different too. You might have a different, so you deal with the positive and negative parts of this operator differently. Or maybe this would have to be the eigenvalue lambda n rather than yeah, the singular that value. Yeah, that would be much more difficult. If you, have, yeah. if you take the eigenvalue, it is probably yeah. true. No, mm. no, it is probably true with the eigenvalue, mm. but then you need to use the type of Litsky uh, theorem yeah. and so on, which is... Yeah. Uh, but it's probably true, actually. I mean, so mm -hmm. I think the, the right guess would be indeed to show that, uh, you know, the, the same formula holds. I mean, this yeah. is a question for you. I mean, <laughs> proved, you know, that uh, the same formula holds when A is no longer positive. I mean, you know, indeed, that's, a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Using the type of result of Litsky and so on. So what mm -hmm. one knows, you know, I mean, the, the technique there is due to Armand Weil. Hmm. It is hmm. to take the wedge, the exterior powers. Right, yes, yes, yes. I see. So, I mean, you might well have a good chance, I mean, indeed, hmm. to, to have this formula without having the positivity of A. Yes. Because hmm. I believe it is true in the commutative case, at least, um, that you've got yeah. it for lambda n. Um, well, you put the eigenvalues instead. Yes. Yeah, that, I yeah. believe that's true. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, make the relation in general. Yeah. Yes, okay, so you have uh, several things to <laughs> yes. think about. There's a lot to do, <laughs> yes. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, but I, I wanted to really insist on this fact, you know, that uh, I mean, it, it gives meaning to the integral sign independently of yes. the. <laughs> yeah, it's not a very strange thing, really. Mm. In fact, you know, I can, what I claim is that I essentially I can write all the integrals which I know in mm. in the form of a singular trace. I mean, this is a kind of exercise you can think about. I mean, you know, all of them. Um, even so in periodic circumstances. Uh, ah, so I see. Yes, that's what I have in mind. I mean, you, you can you can think about all the examples you have of integrals and so on, yep. and and uh, and do the exercise of putting them as a as a Dixman trace, you know, as a, as a okay as a singular trace. If you How about a That's stochastic a, integral? Okay, you have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you have to have, find the right Hilbert space and okay, yeah. and and the, and the right infinitesimal. If you want. That's all. Yeah. Which yeah. is. Um, Hmm. Okay, other question or comment? Okay, so thank you very much once more again. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Very nice talk, yes. Thank you. Thank you.